Okay. Hello and welcome to this event called Demystifying Oxford. My name is Tarun Khaitan and I'm the Vice Dean at the Law Faculty at Oxford. We recognize that from the outside, Oxford can seem a bit mysterious and unwelcoming. This event is an effort to change that perception, at least in regard to how we recruit academic staff at the law faculty. At the university wide level, Professor Anne Trefferton, Pro Vice Chancellor at the university, is also sponsoring the Associate Professor Inclusive Recruitment Project, which aims, among other things, to broaden the race and gender diversity of associate professors at Oxford. For this event, around 348 people have registered from around 45 countries around the world. This probably indicates the need for such an event. Ultimately, we only want to hire the best and brightest as our future colleagues, wherever they happen to come from and whatever their identities. So on behalf of the Dean of the Oxford Law Faculty, Professor Mindy Chen Visat, I welcome all of you. And without further ado, I hand over to the chair and moderator for this event today, Eusebius Mackaiser, who is a South African Rhodes Scholar and a radio broadcaster based in Johannesburg. Thank you so much, Tarun. And it is a pleasure to be hosting this event on behalf of the law faculty of the University of Oxford. I'd spent a couple of years there myself, and now I'm based here in Johannesburg where I'm an author, political analyst, and a broadcaster. A couple of things from my side, just by way of how we're gonna proceed uh, this afternoon. Firstly, thank you so much to all of you for taking time out to learn about Oxford University. You might have all sorts of ideas that you hope to test this afternoon, whether they are true of Oxford. And I think one of the insights you're gonna learn very quickly is that there are multiple Oxford experiences depending on which college you're in and all sorts of other factors. And so we are going to demystify Oxford University for you. Just a couple of housekeeping rules and also to manage your expectations. Firstly, this event is being recorded. Kindly be mindful of that fact. Secondly, in order to allow you to feel secure in asking a question using the Q&A facility, uh, feel free to do so anonymously. When I read out your question, I will not be identifying who you are because you are interested in the question as such and not necessarily revealing your identity. So that is anonymity that you are guaranteed. So please feel free as you listen to each one of the persons I'm gonna introduce as they speak, uh, feel free to ask any questions that come up for you. Thank you, by the way, to everyone who submitted questions beforehand. We had collated those and we pulled out of them some of the dominant ones that we wish to address this afternoon. The last thing I want to say is I have fond memories of Oxford and I wish that we had two, three hours to spare to talk to you about your assumptions about Oxford. However, there are certain questions I'm afraid that will be beyond scope. So what we're focusing on this afternoon is specifically recruitment into the law faculty. There are not unimportant related questions about Oxford as a city, for example, all sorts of other questions that have come through, but we are going to keep it quite tight in terms of our focus thematically around the question of recruitment in particular. Uh, in the unlikely event that we have time left at the end of the allotted total 90 minutes, we might sneak in one or two other interesting questions, but fundamentally the focus is going to be on recruitment. And the first aspects of Oxford life that probably needs to be demystified is that thing called the Oxford tutorial. What the heck is it? And it gives me enormous pleasure to introduce the first person that will speak to you on one of the themes around demystifying Oxford. Now, I know that you have all of our full bios. I'm not going to read them out in turn. But as I invite each person to speak to you, uh, for a couple of minutes before we have a Q&A session later on, I will just give you their designation in terms of what it is that they're currently doing uh, at Oxford University. The first person I have enormous pleasure in introducing you to is Professor Kristen van Zwijten, who is the Clifford Chance Associate Professor of Law and Finance in the Law Faculty, as well as the Gulliver Fellow in Law at Harris Manchester College with an enormous, enormous and impressive CV behind her, both as a research academic as well as a teacher as well, having grown up in Australia and having had a career at Oxbridge 
uh, subsequently in her adult life. I'm going to ask her to address you around this first theme and demystifying this aspect of life at Oxford as a career professional in law. Thank you so much, uh, Eusebius, for the overly generous introduction. I'm worried now I can't possibly live up, live up to this wonderful introduction. Uh, so thank you so much for that and, and for chairing this event. Uh, so Eusebius and Taryn have asked me to speak um, to the Oxford tutorial and to give you uh, a few minutes of explanation uh, into uh, how the Oxford tutorial system works and how you might deliver a tutorial uh, if you are appointed to an academic position in the university. Uh, now, Oxford is very well known, I'm, I'm sure you're aware, uh, for offering students teaching in small groups, and that small group teaching is called the tutorial. In Cambridge, that equivalent small group teaching is called a supervision. At undergraduate level at Oxford in the law faculty, a tutorial group will usually be two or three students. At postgraduate level in our master's programs, it will be somewhere between one and five students in a tutorial group. Now for undergraduates in the law faculty at Oxford, the bulk of your teaching is delivered through this small group tutorial format. Tutorials are what undergraduate students spend most of their time preparing for. They spend a large amount of a large proportion of their time each week in term time preparing for tutorials. And they can reasonably expect uh, that core course content for each of the topics that they do in an undergraduate degree will be delivered to them through these tutorial series, uh, through such a tutorial series. For postgraduates in the law faculty at Oxford, tutorials remain very important, uh, but probably equally important in our postgraduate programs uh, are seminars in which uh, typically between 20 and 30 students will meet with two or three seminar leaders to debate the most difficult, interesting or con controversial questions uh, in a particular area. These modes of teaching delivery in the law faculty are then complemented by lectures. But lectures are used differently in each course that's offered to students. At postgraduate level, sometimes lectures are designed to run alongside a seminar series, introducing students to content before they come to discuss it in seminars and tutorials. At undergraduate level, uh, lectures are more commonly offered independently of the timing of a tutorial series, and they will vary in terms of whether they're focused on exploring particularly important or difficult topics or pitched at some more um, introductory level. <clears throat> That's just turning my email off so you didn't have to listen to any more pings. Uh, each subject uh, that's taught to undergraduates and postgraduates uh, has a group of academics who are involved who will agree on the combination of lectures, seminars and tutorials that are offered uh, in that subject. And of course, we survey students at the end of the year to gauge how each subject offering can be improved the following academic year. The opportunity to be taught in tutorials is highly unusual. The, the contrast between uh, such small group teaching and, for example, a degree program in which, let's say, most content is delivered in lectures of several hundred students, uh, the contrast between these two modes uh, of content delivery is obvious, and I think it's fair to say it, it's extreme. Students at Oxford do really get to know academics in the law faculty. They do really get to tell academics about their ideas and ask them their questions. That's the point of a tutorial or small group teaching. This is obviously a wonderful, very rare, special opportunity for students, but it can also be highly valuable for academics, particularly when you teach in areas that relate directly to your research. In my own uh, tutorial uh, teaching, I run all my new ideas by my postgraduate students, and I learn a lot uh, from their questions from the questions that are put to me in this small group context. It is not uncommon in a tutorial to be asked a question that you cannot answer. In this way, a tutorial can be as uncomfortable for a tutor as it can be for a student until you get used to the fact that it is perfectly acceptable to offer your first thoughts or your first reaction to the question and then tell the student you'll think more about it and you'll come back to them when you meet them, for example, the following week for the next in the tutorial series. Oxford offers academics considerable autonomy in the way that they 
uh, design and deliver their teaching. And consistently with this, law faculty members vary and they enjoy autonomy in this, in how they structure their tutorials. But I think it's fair to say there are some common elements uh, to tutorials offered by uh, members of the Oxford Law Faculty. First, students are expected to read in advance. Okay, so a tutorial is not a lecture, but rather it's a discussion between people who've already read and engage with the material that's been set for reading by the tutor. In the tutorial then, uh, students will come in having already engaged with the material and tutors will then seek to assess in that tutorial discussion how far students have gone in their comprehension of the reading. Tutors will seek to correct misunderstanding, uh, cure common error, and to encourage their students to push them towards acquiring an even more advanced understanding of the material when they go away to reread and revise that again uh, at the end of the tutorial series and in preparation for formal assessment. In tutorials, tutors ask hard questions that are designed to get at the fundamentals of the topic and designed to inspire students to go further when they come back again to revise that reading. Consistently with these objectives, tutorial reading lists are rarely short uh, and in fact, are uh, usually very long uh, uh, in the law faculty. Tutorial lists, generally speaking, are designed to enable a student to immerse themselves in a particular topic. So that's the first common feature, uh, non-short or long reading lists, which students are expected to engage with in advance and then come ready to discuss in the tutorial. And the second common feature of tutorials given by law faculty members at Oxford is that students will usually, not in every case, but certainly in the vast majority of cases, be expected to produce a piece of written work in advance of the tutorial. Now, this may or may not be discussed in detail in the tutorial. That's up to the tutor in terms of how they design their tutorials. But one way or another, tutors will have to give feedback on each piece of written work that's tendered by the students, not just the substance, but also the structure uh, through which the analysis is delivered and the style of the writing more generally. This is time consuming for academics, but it's highly valued by students. And it, you, can, you can see how students pick up on comments as a tutorial series progresses and their writing changes accordingly. And th this, this feedback is obviously very much valued by students who put huge amounts of effort into preparing tutorial work under very extreme time pressure. So undergraduate students in the law faculty at Oxford are told that it might take them up to 30 hours to prepare for a single tutorial. The bulk of that 30 hours will be spent reading. But at the end of that period of immersing themselves in some often very complex reading, they will then need to put pen to paper and write something on a question that's been set by the tutor and then send that in before they uh, turn up to the tutorial. I've said, and I wish to emphasize really that there is no single tutorial format. So when it comes to actually uh, meeting with your students, um, you will get to decide how you want to structure the discussion in each tutorial. Um, and most of us experiment in how we deliver tutorials and we change our styles over time. So when I was first appointed to this position um, in Oxford, uh, I used to prepare a list of questions uh, which I wanted discussion to be structured around. And they were questions that I thought um, went to the things that were most important, most difficult, or most likely to generate error or misunderstanding in a particular topic. I still do that. So I still come into a tutorial with a framework of this kind, which I've thought about in advance and prepared my own thoughts on each of the questions. But I now listen more to uh, what students have written about in my tutorials and I'll often ask them to present for a few minutes the main thrust of an argument or the main the key elements of their analysis and I'll ask other students to respond to that as part of the discussion but within an overall framework that I've designed with a view to trying to get to the fundamentals of the particular topic. You do also enjoy autonomy in setting, designing the reading lists for tutorials. 
But of course, there is an expectation that everything you do as a tutor is designed to help your student along their learning journey to covering what is fundamental in a particular subject. And in recent years, the law faculty has moved for undergraduates to agreeing what is called a core reading list. And that's a list that is agreed by all the members of a particular teaching group. And it's this that undergraduate students are expected to evidence familiarity with in formal assessment. So whilst tutors do enjoy freedom to design their tutorial lists as they see fit, um, plainly tutors seek to design those lists in a way that is consistent with the faculty's agreed core reading list so that we can help students to be prepared for formal assessment at the end of their degree. I hope this has given you some insight into how tutorials work. Um, just to conclude, if you are uh, appointed to a position in Oxford and you've not ever uh, uh, worked in Oxford or Cambridge um, and you haven't uh, been a student in either of those institutions and therefore um, you haven't been in a tutorial or small group setting quite like this before. Um, you shouldn't be at all anxious about that. There's lots of different ways you can learn uh, how to give um, an Oxford tutorial, bearing in mind that there is considerable freedom uh, as to what that means exactly. Actually, it's just about helping your students to engage at a very high level uh, with, with the, the content and to acquire an advanced understanding of the materials but when you arrive there's various training opportunities that are available for you to you you can shadow others who give tutorials and faculty members in my experience are very very generous indeed with sharing their reading lists so uh, each time I've started to teach a new subject faculty members have always given me tutorial reading lists and I've used that that as a starting point for designing my own tutorial sheets so you will not be starting uh, with a with a blank canvas as it were um, thanks very much. Thank you, Kristen. That was super, super clear and very detailed and helpful. One of the next things that you probably wonder about Oxford is its weird collegiate system in particular. It sometimes feels like a federal political system. And so we have asked Dr. Nicola Trott, who is the senior tutor and the tutor for graduate studies at Balliol College to speak to that aspect of Oxford life and to demystify it for you. She has grown up and lived between the USA and the UK as well, returned to Oxford uh, as an academic and in particular in these administrative positions. So she's perfectly positioned to speak to this question of how Oxford is structured. Thank you so much, Eusebius, and thank you, Kristen, for that wonderful tutorial on tutorials. That was very helpful. <laughs> um, hello, everybody. I Yes, Taryn has asked me to explain Oxford's federal structure, the relationship between university divisions, faculties and colleges, the three types of associate professor appointments, titular and statutory professorships, all in eight minutes. I'm going to have a go. I don't know whether I'll crack it, but here we go. I'm what's called a senior tutor, and I'm a senior tutor at Balliol College. That is a position that looks after academic administration fundamentally. And in my own college, for instance, they're all slightly particular, but they have more in common than meets the eye. We have around 750 students, undergraduate and graduate. We have people from a whole range of disciplines and sub-disciplines, we have around 100 academics, over 100 academics, some permanent, some floating in and out. And we have a similar number of domestic staff, people who help us run our lives. And um, altogether, it's a very sort of uh, concrete, thriving, intimate, but also challenging kind of community. Um, now, all the colleges are, as I say, different, but they do have things in common, and I will, I will come back to that in, in a bit. I do remember once uh, encountering some tourists, which you do occasionally in Oxford, who asked, where is Oxford University? And I have to say, I was absolutely stumped because I couldn't really point to anywhere in particular. It's everywhere and yet nowhere. Um, and that tells you a great deal about the way the university is organized or thinks of itself. Um, as we know, Oxford is rather old and um, it it's goes back this kind of organization to uh, the 13th century. 
But funnily enough, the, the organization of the structure of the university keeps changing. We never tire of trying to organize ourselves better. And um, the recent changes actually date as recently as the 1960s and even the 2000s. So obviously we haven't got it right yet. We're keeping on going. I'm just going to share with you one rather scary, Tarrant thinks it's scary, organogram of the university uh, structure, just so you can see what it looks like. And I'm going to have a go here, but Michelle may help me if I fail to deliver. I can do it for you, Nicola, if you give me a second. Um, here it goes. Here it goes. I think I've got it. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. If you just click onto view In, onto at the top of your PDF, go to view. Oh, yeah. Go to view. Uh, no, go. you're in file. So go to view. Um, view tab. Go across. Sorry. I've got lots of tabs in the way. This may be better done by you. OK, if you come out of it, I'll do it for you now. Yeah. Sorry about that, everybody. Thanks, Michelle. That's very helpful. Um, what we've got at the top here is, is the top level organization of Oxford. And really, your experience as a, uh, an associate professor would be rather different if you, were, if you were coming into the university at that level. You're actually some way down here if you're an associate professor, and I will come to that. But at the top level, it's quite important that there's this sovereign parliament called congregation that could comprises about 4,500 members, all of the top level academics and administrators and university officers. And below that sits the executive here in council. And as you can see, it has a large number of committees that feed into it and report to it. Now, most of the real business, the day-to-day -day business is done here at this executive level, but the congregation can and does sort of challenge council. Much of its business is passive, but sometimes it gets pretty aggressive. And every vice chancellor has to be aware of that. Now, what that tells us about Oxford is that the, the governance is very devolved. That's quite a famous thing about Oxford. It does have devolved governance. And the devolved governance goes right down to here to, to the department level. I'm sure the law faculty members here will confirm that they are very uh, mindful of their own business and um, of conducting it appropriately at their own level. Alongside all this university business, there is something called the Conference of Colleges, and this is where the colleges sit. And as you notice, there's no actual direct line between the two. And this is also something very peculiar about Oxford, that we have colleges that are themselves independent, autonomous institutions. Now, how can that possibly work? Well, it works in various ways, but one of the ways is that college representatives sit on all these committees. And the other is that they organize themselves into what's called the conference of colleges and um, conduct business and communicate with the university that way. Now, why this, um, I think we can stop sharing this terrible organogram now. We needn't scare, scare you any further with that. Um, thank you, Michelle. Um, why this is important is that the devolved nature of the administration affects individual academics. I think Kristen has already talked about how much freedom academics have. They have a remarkable amount of freedom, far more than in my experience you have at, say, a, a civic university. You get, you're free to organize your time quite largely. You're free to teach the kinds of material you want to teach within an agreed syllabus, and you are free to give emphasis to that material in the way that you choose. You're also very free to choose the focus of your research, and that's very important for academics, and not to be taken lightly. You also, in the collegiate structure, if you have a college association, the freedom, and it is a kind of freedom, to rub shoulders with all sorts of other disciplines and the people working at the cutting edge in those disciplines. And that is also fascinating in itself and also quite an enriching aspect of the Oxford Collegiate experience. 
and it's it's one of the more unique factors really that that multidisciplinary environment is very um, central to the way the university operates and it has all sorts of dividends in cross-disciplinary research um, and we like to think actually had an influence in say the Oxford vaccine recently and the development of that which has been absolutely phenomenal. So what are the three different kinds of associate professors? Well, there are two that are very closely knitted to the college and they are very similar in a way. They just have a different weighting between the faculty and the college. Um, and then there's a third, those are both tutorial fellowships, by the way, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, the third is what's called a non-tutorial fellowship, and that's based largely in the faculty, and the teaching of that sort of post is done almost exclusively within a faculty or university environment. In terms of tutorial fellowships, what could you expect when you're applying for a job? Well, you can expect the uh, appointment committee to be balanced, to have gender balance, if possible to have other kinds of representation on it. You can expect it to apply the selection criteria for the job and only those criteria. They're not looking for other things. And you can expect them to try always to reach a decision on consensus or failing that, but that's rare in my experience on majority view. And so the representatives on appointment panels always try to work together to achieve the best outcome for both partners. And you, as if you are selected, will be an employee of both parties. You'll have a contract with your faculty, your department, and you'll have a contract with the college. They are coeval and coterminous, but they are distinct employers. And so as a, a tutorial fellow in a college and in the law faculty, you have these two contracts and you have two centers of gravity in your life. You have one in the faculty and one in the college and they are both very important to you and you to them. Um, so I think uh, maybe I've said about enough. I mean, any tutorial fellowship is going to involve, I should perhaps end by saying, coming back to what Kristen has been talking about, a strong commitment to undergraduate teaching. You get to teach some of the brightest and best from across the world. It, they are genuinely amazing students. A lot of them. Some of them are also uh, a little bit mixed up at an early stage in their lives. They can need a bit of support. And that is also one of the key things around an Oxford Tutorial Fellowship, that there is a pastoral element. element. There is a kind of paternalistic kind of role in, in, in a college. But you have a lot of professional support services around you. And you are fundamentally guiding your students mainly in their academic work and where needed towards other kinds of support. So I think probably I've said enough. I'm very happy to take questions insofar as there are any that arise. Um, and thank you very much for this opportunity to talk to you today. Thank you, Nicola, for that tutorial on the federal system. <laughs> I think that works out extremely, extremely well. And Next is the most direct question in many of your minds, of course, which is what exactly is the process involved in terms of the hiring elements when it comes to trying to get onto the path towards associate professorship in the law faculty within this behemoth that is the federal system within Oxford University. You've already heard from Tarun. I've known him for an awfully long time. I think we're no longer children. Um, he is the Vice Dean responsible precisely for this area of life within the law faculty. He's also an excellent researcher and teacher in his own right, like both Nicola and Kristen, and has specialized in all sorts of important fields within law, not least being one of the world's experts on discrimination. And in fact, the mere fact that he is about to speak to you as Vice Dean um, is another demystifying of Oxford University. You probably expected a 500 year old white straight male to be speaking to you. I think him speaking to you is testimony to an attempt to grapple with the question of diversity and representation. Tarun, over to you. Uh, 
Okay, now that I'm unmuted and you can't hear me. Um, thanks very much, Eusebius, to that extremely generous introduction. Um, so I'm going to try to explain our recruitment process and I'm going to focus primarily on our associate professorships. I'm going to do that mainly because, uh, well, first, the law faculty at Oxford is just about to advertise for associate professorships in law, so it's most uh, timely. And secondly, for reasons we are still trying to figure out internally, uh, we have had uh, somewhat better success in diversifying both on the gender and less so, but still better on the race front of statutory professors at the university wide level, uh, but less so for associate and titular professors. And uh, you know, statutory professors are the absolute top rung of uh, of the academic hierarchy. And, uh, and it's, it's somewhat, uh, it's a good thing that, that that's become better than we used to be, uh, but our associate professorship cohort has been uh, a bit more uh, resistant to, uh, to diversification. Now, of course, we fully recognize that we are far from where we would like to be on all fronts and hence this event. But part of the problem with recruitment for associate professorships um, is, uh, is the narrowness of the pool we attract and, and partly institutional reputations become self-fulfilling if Oxford has a reputation for being this exclusive uh, elitist stuffy place, then people who find all those features uncomfortable don't bother applying to us and therefore we end up being uh, or in danger of being elitist and stuffy. So, uh, so in some ways, the effort is to challenge that perception because that perception is the biggest challenge for us um, in attracting a wide enough pool that will allow us uh, to, uh, to, to become uh, an even better law faculty. The second caveat I want to put in place is that I'm going to explain our general recruitment process to you. Uh, but if there's one thing that uh, Nikki has highlighted in her explanation, it is that Oxford has many different moving parts. Not all of them speak to each other. Uh, and, uh, and there is, it's not a tightly uh, run ship, which means that all my general comments are subject to particular instructions and particular job, district, uh, job descriptions they always overwrite anything I'm going to say. So, so please don't cite this video and say, oh, but Tyron said that in his video. So, so, uh, so your instructions don't count. Uh, that always takes precedence. And obviously, uh, as Nikki mentioned, our federal structure with two employers uh, for associate professors slightly complicates our recruitment process. Um, I'm mainly going to speak to, now there are three different types of associate professors without um, bombarding you with too much information. Um, one of them is called a non-tutorial uh, associate professor. And a non-tutorial fellow uh, who is an associate professor that does not do many or sometimes even any of the tutorials that, that Kristen uh, highlighted. They may do some tutorials for the faculty, but they don't do any tutorials for the colleges. So what I'm going to speak to mainly applies to the two remaining types of associate professors who are called tutorial fellows. And they are also of two different variety because um, some of them have a college heavy role and some of them have a university heavy role. So it's just the balance that is different. Uh, so some do two thirds of their teaching for the college and one third for the faculty. Others do two thirds for the faculty. These are rough numbers and there's a lot of variation in between. But, um, but different aspects they might be, both of these types of tutorial fellowship and associate professorships usually will, um, will find everything I'm going to say relevant. Uh, for interest, the four associate professorships that we are going to advertise later this month are all college heavy 
tutorial fellowships. So what I'm going to say is especially uh, hopefully relevant. So uh, our internal norm, and by the way, obviously this is all relevant to the law faculty. Other faculties may share some of this, uh, but they may not. So, uh, so you have to uh, clarify these things with other faculties. Uh, our recruitment panels um, will typically include representatives uh, from the recruiting college as well as the faculty. The ratio of the panel members between the college and the faculty will depend on whether the tutorial fellowship is college heavy or faculty heavy. The panel will always include representatives uh, from two genders. Uh, many, if not most of the panel members would have gone through anti-bias training. Uh, it is the duty of the panel's chair to ensure that throughout the recruitment process, all candidates are judged strictly and solely in accordance with the essential and desirable criteria specified on the job description. Uh, long listing may be used for certain jobs, but not necessarily. Uh, but long listing, if used in short listing, are usually based solely on the candidate's application letter and CV. Sometimes panels may also like to see uh, their written work and references before shortlisting, but often these are required after the shortlists are drawn up. The details will differ from job to job, so it's important to read carefully. The final decision, the final offer, uh, is, is based on a holistic appraisal of a variety of inputs and sources, which typically will include a written application, a CV, a submitted, uh, well, two, usually two submitted pieces of written research work, usually three references, a teaching presentation, a research presentation, and an interview. And I'm going to speak briefly about each of these elements, each of these inputs into, uh, that inform our hiring process. Now, please note that, you know, I'm not going to give you tips about how to write the best application letter. I'll tell you what the panel looks for, and I'm sure you will have other mentors and advisors, uh, and I hope you do. Uh, I should also mention that our um, law faculties uh, recruitment will always name at least one faculty member who is not a panel member, but who is available to answer any questions that candidates, potential candidates may have <clears throat> about the process. So please feel free to get in touch with them because uh, they are under a duty not to pass on uh, the, any correspondence with applicants to the panel. And that correspondence is not uh, considered by the panel at all. The college nominees uh, may well be panel members, so it's important to make that distinction and only assume that the person who you can contact uh, is not on the panel if it is uh, clearly specified and the law faculty's uh, adverts will always specify it. So let me start with the application letter. Um, a normal application letter uh, is between three and five pages uh, and that's that's partly based on past practice, partly based on common sense that uh, the selection panel is likely reading hundreds of applications in a very short duration. Uh, most of the information we seek can be conveyed by up to five pages. If otherwise specified, obviously follow those norms. But please remember that we have to read a lot, so be kind to us. Um, and as vice dean in charge of recruitment, I do a lot of recruitment and go through a, a, a huge load of uh, uh, paperwork. So, so please be especially kind to me. Um, it's very important that your application letter is tailored to the essential and desirable job criteria, which again makes it easy for the panel to understand how you satisfy the requirements. A well-structured application letter with separate subheadings with clear, easy to read font, Good spacing is usually easier to read. I'm sure you've all read applications where since the page limit is five, the font is eight and you need a microscope to read it and there are no margins and there is no spa spacing, don't do that. <laughs> because 
it those those applications really stick out and and are irritating and and you know people you know so panel members are human beings uh, so it's best not to irritate them uh, so just 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 be sensible and reasonable um broadly uh, you know the details will differ job descriptions will differ but broadly most panels will be looking for three things for a tutorial tutorial fellowship research excellence teaching expertise and whether you're a good colleague to have. And that means whether you'll be a good citizen, you'll do your administrative duties um, or not. You will, uh, you will undertake uh, all the tasks that come with being part of an institution. So, uh, so these are the three main things that any, uh, any aspect uh, of, of the recruitment will test. Just a quick word on teaching that may be exclusive to the law faculty, most but not all of our undergraduate teaching mainly concerns English law. Uh, but that does not mean that you cannot show your expertise in constitutional law if you have not taught English law before. Um, so we recognize that these skills are translatable. Um, even though you're required to teach English law, if you can show that you have sufficient knowledge or ability to do so uh, based on the criteria, uh, don't rule yourself out just because you have not taught English law before. Uh, and, and also some of our undergraduate courses are comparative and transnational. And a lot, if not most of our post-grad, taught post-grad courses are international or comparative or transnational or deal with other jurisdictions. So, uh, so please, uh, please bear that in, uh, in mind. Next uh, thing, again, submitted at the time of making your application is your CV. <clears throat> we prefer uh, what is called a, a British style CV rather than an American style CV, which means two to four pages. Um, unless, again, unless otherwise specified. Uh, long form American CVs, which have 15 to 20 pages, please don't send them. Um, they, they take a very long time to read and they are, they are CVs, you know, academic cultures differ and uh, US style CVs list every single conference you have ever been to, every paper you've ever presented. They're not typically required. We only expect to see your key achievements and data that is relevant to the job in question that you would want the panel to know. And sometimes the danger of including too much information is that it's difficult to sift what is really important and what is less important. So it actually does you no favor to, to include too much information in a CV, highlight what's important and tailoring it again to your job, to the job criteria also helps. So these are the two things that will typically inform uh, the shortlisting process. Um, Next, we move to other inputs, your submitted research work, usually if shortlisted, sometimes after a long list and rarely, but not unheard of at the time of the application itself. You may be asked to submit uh, one, more usually two pieces of written work. Uh, this will be your research work, <clears throat> normally around uh, 10,000 words each. Uh, including footnotes, but again, look at the guidelines. Uh, they will be read closely, uh, at least after the shortlist. So even if they're sought at an earlier date, um, they, they, will, they may be read after a long list has been drawn up. Um, it will be a very uh, <laughs> brave panel that will try to read uh, the written work of all the submitted applicants. Uh, but that can happen. But they, but at least after the shortlist, be assured that all your submitted written work of 10,000 words each will be read very closely by at least one panel member. Uh, and if the panel feels that it does not have expertise to read it carefully, um, it reserves the right to invite an external expert, external to the panel, who is an expert in that area who may uh, read it and may sit on your interview to advise the panel on your written research work. Uh, this will be judged on content, not uh, on where it was published. 
So whether it's a book chapter or a journal article, whether it's a top ranking journal or a low rank journal, it's completely irrelevant to us. Um, whether it's unpublished, that's again uh, a discussion of the panel. So check with the panel if they'll accept unpublished manuscripts. Um, usually they prefer published or at least accepted for publication material. But what is uh, important, and they may insist on a journal article and not accept book chapters, uh, but place of publication otherwise is not relevant, content is. And remember that this is the main source of information the panel has on your research excellence. So please choose what you send to us very wisely. It does not matter that you have five brilliant pieces that you just failed to send to us uh, because they will not be read as carefully uh, or may not be read at all. Uh, but, but these two submitted pieces will be read very carefully. So this is your best chance to showcase to us uh, your uh, research excellence. So this is really, I cannot emphasize how important this is. The next input in, this, in, the, in the system are your references. We usually require three references. Uh, we used to require them earlier in the process. We are moving towards requiring them later in the process, mainly because um, research shows that it, it leads to uh, a more uh, diverse application pool if references are sought later. But again, we're still in the process of evolving. There is no hard rule about this. So, so please read the guideline carefully to see when references are requested. Um, the applicant should not have seen the reference, needless to say. Uh, they should not have drafted the reference or played a role in drafting them. Uh, of course, you have to inform your referees of the criteria and the job details, uh, and also how you satisfy them. One of the reasons we are requiring, we're moving towards requiring references after shortlisting is that we re recognize that asking referees for references can be embarrassing, and some, especially for candidates from minority groups, um, it can be um, an uphill battle because you have, you know, you don't want a referee to, to think who, who do they think they are, who do, are you really eligible for this job? If you have the shortlist in the bag, you can go to a referee with confidence and say, look, I have already been shortlisted for this job. Can you please write me a reference and be my advocate? So that's the thinking behind asking for references later, but references matter. So please ask for references from people who know you personally, who can speak to all your qualities in detail and give evidence based on their interaction with you. Uh, so these are the most helpful references. Perfunctory and ill-informed references from big names uh, are completely useless. They're a waste of space and they actually hurt you because the opportunity cost of a grandee who has given a three-line reference is that you have lost out on an advocate who could have told us something useful about you. Uh, so uh, we, we are often asked if the reference has to be an academic reference. <laughs> if we are trying to find out your research ability and your teaching ability, usually it will be an academic who is best placed to tell us about that. If you think that there's somebody else in your unique circumstance who is not an academic, but still can speak to those qualities, sure. Uh, you know, but we don't care who the referee is, but we want to know, A, that they know you and are able to speak from a position of knowledge, and B, that they know what they're talking about, that they have ability and judgment and a pro professional capacity in which they have been able to, uh, to judge your research excellence, your teaching competence, and your citizenship qualities. Uh, not all referees have to speak to all three qualities, but try to ensure that between them, they cover the ground. And obviously you can't ensure it because you don't read the references, but it's important to tell them that these are the criteria. These are the things I'm going to be judged on. And you will know which referee would have seen which side of you. A referee you have co-taught with uh, is probably best to teach to your, uh, speak to your teaching. Whereas, uh, I don't know, maybe a doctoral supervisor or a, um, a manuscript referee uh, is best, or a journal editor is best place to speak to a research uh, quality or, a, or an area expert. I don't know. So you're the best judge of that. And we can't advise you obviously on which referee to choose, except that choose a referee who will be your best advocate for the qualities 
we are looking for. The last point on referees, it's your job to chase them, to make sure we receive the references. If they don't come in in time, it is your loss because the panel is deprived of reading a case made for you from, a, from an advocate of your choice. So it's really important that you chase them. And if people are flaky, unreliable, uh, just don't ask them uh, for references. That's sad, but we know that, you know, uh, not everybody, you know, there are different levels of conscientiousness in, in the academy. We're all, you know, flawed human beings. So choose your referees carefully and make sure you, you ask people who will deliver. Um, the next thing, and probably the most uh, mysterious part of the Oxford recruitment process is our teaching presentation. Uh, for tutorial fellowships, you will almost always be asked to do a teaching presentation. It's slightly awkward because people know that Oxford requires tutorial teaching, but obviously tutorial teaching requires a student group of students who have done the reading in advance, have written an essay in advance, you have read the essay in advance, and you're discussing that material. We can't organize that for our candidates, right? You all have different skills, you're coming from different areas. So typically, a teaching presentation will invite you to speak for a brief moment, usually between 10 to 15 minutes or so, but again, subject to uh, the guidelines you're given by the panel, about 10 to 15 minutes or so to a bunch of usually actual, but sometimes pretend students. Right? So there will often be actual undergraduates in the real room or these days more likely a virtual room, but sometimes the panel may pretend to be students. Um, and the instruction, is likely, well, read the instruction carefully. And if you have queries, ask for clarification, but usually it'll be start a discussion-based seminar followed by a Q&A, right? So speak for 10 to 15 minutes, like you would at the start of a teaching seminar, right? The goal is that we want to see what is the kind of teacher you are. And these teaching skills are transferable from a lecture to a seminar to a tutorial model. Um, we want to see whether you can engage students, whether you can make them interested in your topic, whether you can deliver that passion, how clearly you explain things, whether you can challenge them, whether, whether you can deepen their understanding. And these are universally good qualities required in a teacher, empathy, uh, figuring out where a student is, teaching at their level, being accessible. So, so, so think about the skills that you are being expected to display to a panel. Everybody on the panel will know that this is awkward. It's awkward to teach students you have never met before, especially in a recruitment context when you're likely to be nervous. Things may be even more awkward if there are no actual students present and the panel pretends to be your students. But take solace in the fact that this will be true of all candidates because we will use the same format for all candidates who are being interviewed and short, who have been shortlisted. So use your allotted time wisely. There is no winning formula, but there is one losing formula, which is please do not try to put in a one hour lecture and cram it into a 10 minute presentation. I've seen that happen. It's extremely painful. Uh, for the candidate and for the panel, right? Um, so, so be sensible and use, do what is doable in the 10 or 15 minutes. And of course the panel understands that, right? Nobody, the teaching presentation is not the time to show the panel that you know all there is to know on consideration in contract law, right? That is, if that is your research expertise, use the research part of your, uh, a presentation to do that. The teaching presentation is to get to the student, clearly articulate the point of that exercise, tell them what the teaching outcomes is uh, and focus and, uh, and deliver that. Uh, another painful thing is um, sometimes, so because this is an awkward scenario, it's probably best not to put a student or worse a panel member on a spot by asking them a question from the topic uh, because uh, that's happened in the past uh, 
And what it does is it, if the student develops cold feet and freezes, there is this awkward silence in the room, uh, which is very difficult to challenge, right? So, so try to give a talk that will invite questions and rest assured that the students have been briefed to be keen to talk, right? And uh, so there will be some enthusiastic student who, who will set the ball rolling. If not, if you feel that you, if, if there is silence, you know, feel free to ask open-ended questions, but try not to put anybody on spot by directing a question at them because that just makes things awkward. So these are just, you know, a, a common sense things, but, you know, it's a ner nerve wracking process. So it's useful to just spell them out. The Q&A at the end of the teaching presentation is also extremely important because it's designed to check how you engage with the students, whether you take their questions seriously, whether you help them articulate their difficulty seriously, because sometimes students have a question but are struggling to explain what the question is, um, whether you answer them clearly, whether you can deepen their understanding, and it's absolutely okay, as Kristen said, like in a tutorial, like in a teaching presentation to say, I don't know the answer to that, but that's a good question. I'll come back next week and tell you what the answer is, right? This is not to test your knowledge. Well, unless it's a very fundamental basic. If you've chosen a topic and you don't know the fundamentals, that will obviously raise alarm bells. But you know, you don't have to know the minutiae of every case on the topic. Um, it's, not, it's not that kind of test, right? It's a teaching ability test. Um, and whether you can challenge the potential, the panel will usually hear feedback from the students after you've left the room um, and will take it seriously. So uh, usually, but again, Things, are, things differ and we are also evolving and figuring out uh, what is the best way of doing things. The next, the penultimate important criterion input is your research presentation. This will typically be also be between 10 and 15 minutes. Use them wisely. Read the instructions carefully. <clears throat> See whether the panel has asked you to speak generally about your research profile and agenda which is a very different presentation from whether they have asked you to actually explain a particular piece of research or a paper you have written to the panel. Right? If they want to see the arc of your research and want to get to know you as a research scholar, give them that holistic research picture of this is me as a research scholar, this is where I am, this is where I'm going, this is where I plan to go. This is why what I do is important. Right? If they want you to focus on one research output, do that. Again, um, don't cram too many things in because 10, 15 minutes is a short time. Uh, remember that the panel is likely to include at least one expert in your subject area, as well as generalists. And some of these generalists may not be lawyers at all, let alone a lawyer in your subject area. So your challenge is to engage the former without losing the latter. And we understand the difficulty. And again, this is the same for everyone. So, so try, uh, and of course, when the subject expert takes you up on Q&A on your research presentation, that is the time to, uh, to show your flair and to show uh, just your, to be technical. Uh, but but the more accessible and engaging you are uh, to the others on the panel, um, that's usually likely to be better. But of course, this is all subject to the key point that you know research is technical, and sometimes people outside the discipline just simply cannot ex understand everything, and you don't want to end up spending your entire time just explaining uh, key words in terms of art because your 10 minutes will disappear in no time. So there's a balance to be struck between these. Final issue, the actual interview. <clears throat> be direct, be honest, answer to the best of your abilities. The fact that you have made it to the interview already means that you are excellent in a very tough field. It already means that the panel thinks very highly of you. So there's no need to be defensive and try to steal those nerves. It, you know, I've been through enough interviews to know that it's easy, easier said than done, but knowing that you have people who are deeply impressed 
by your application in a very competitive field should give you some sense of self-confidence and good luck. Even if you don't make it, you clearly are a star who no doubt already has or will soon get another excellent opportunity. We have no illusions that we are the only game in town. There are many excellent universities. And if you are making to the final stage two, two shortlists and interviews, of course, you're already a star and we can use you for a job only hire one person. Finally, the panel will usually allow you an opportunity to ask a question at the end of the interview. You don't have to ask a question and do so only if you have a genuine question about an aspect of the job that you don't understand and would really like to know more about. Keep it short. Try not to ask more than one because interview days are extremely busy and tiring for the panel members too. But um, I think uh, that's all um, I will say and shut up there. Back to you, Eusebius. Thank you, Tarun. I'm not sure about shutting up. That was uh, absolutely, absolutely enthralling to listen to. Made me miss being a law student. I would have loved to be taught by you, but um, we were contemporaries, so that wouldn't have been possible. Probably, with only slight exaggeration, the most important person, a de facto head of department, is Charlotte Vinicom. Charlotte is the senior administrator uh, who helps in the faculty with a range of management and government issues and the kind of person that I made sure I sucked up to uh, in my Oxford life in the philosophy department's uh, equivalent <laughs> structure. And Charlotte had been listening extremely closely to her other colleagues, what they had said, and it will fill out some frequently asked questions we might think of them as in her um, enormous experience, the kinds of questions that may be top of mind that hasn't yet been addressed such as, for, for example, how does shortlisting happen? So I'm gonna leave her to deal with some FAQs. And then after that, we'll proceed in the allotted time remaining to go in order of priority, first through your submitted questions, as many as we can. And um, I'm delighted at the tons of questions that you've asked so far, um, but only if we have time will we get also to some of your typed out Q&A questions and comments. And if any of you need to slip out virtually in the next couple of minutes, uh, don't fear. Some of you had asked, and my apologies for not flagging it earlier. The point of this recording is precisely so that it can live on. Digital footprints are permanent. We'll be sure to make sure that the entire recording is available to you and also emailed out to you. Over to you, Charlotte. Thank you very much. Um, so I've been learning as I go along uh, by listening to my colleagues. Um, and so I think there are one or two uh, points that I will try and make that I hope will clarify or plug a few gaps as we've gone along. So one of them I think is worth saying is that we don't we don't farm recruitment out to the HR department in any in any type of job at Oxford. We do it ourselves. So you're sort of looking at the, the HR <laughs> recruitment team here. Um, it, it, we invest a huge amount of time and expertise and resources in recruitment. Um, and um, we also uh, one of the things that takes the time is to work very closely with the college on assembling the panel, getting the further particulars right so that the balance is correct and the precise sort of nuances of the, 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 the selection criteria are right for that college and that field and, and the particular role in the faculty. Um, so we work really closely all the time with the college. Um, and I think, and, and I, I, so I think it's worth making that point that we assemble a panel that's unique to that role each time. And that's done with oversight from the, um, the, the social sciences division. Um, and um, I, I think as, as I've been reading the, the questions that are coming through, I mean, I've, I've been doing this job for so long that I don't really, it's hard for me to have any perspective on this. So I, I'm going to let you into a secret, which is that I'm learning from these questions, how we can present the information about the law faculty better, how we can tweak the further particulars so that um, we don't have the same frequently asked questions. But that was what I was, so what I wanted to start with really was to talk about the questions I get in the background. As soon as we've advertised a job, I'm waiting for the queries to come in. Now we don't get, a huge, I don't get a huge amount of queries, interestingly, um, but there is one question that comes up all the time and it is the hardest one to answer. And that is, 
am I a suitable candidate for this job? Should I apply? Um, and I completely understand, and I'm glad people ask me that question, but I understand why they might feel they want that initial encouragement. Um, so I just wanted to, to sort of say what, what I do with those kinds of questions. Um, because of course, as an administrator, I mean, I don't know anything about law. I, I can't assess anybody's CV. I can't assess uh, their suitability uh, for the job from a, a summary of their CV that they might send me. So I see it as my role to encourage each person that asks that question to refer back to those further particulars that we have, you know, before that job goes live, we've spent a lot of time preparing that document. Um, and it's absolutely the case that those selection criteria are crafted to match the duties of the role. And so that's why it's so important that you just simply refer back to those selection criteria. And if you, if, and I would always say to anybody, if you feel you can make a case for yourself against those criteria, then please do apply because I know how much that panel appreciates every single application that they get to look at. Um, and, I, I, and I know how much time they're prepared to put into it. And it doesn't matter how many ap applications we get, they will look at every single one in the same amount of detail. Um, and and they, they really do appreciate receiving those applications. Um, the other, and I'll just talk, I'll go on to the shortlisting in a moment, but um, the other kind of question I get is, is something so specific and technical, I can't hope to answer it. And so what I would always do with those is pass that on completely anonymously, it's anonymized, onto a member of the panel who I think can answer the question so that I can give that person a, a, as informed answer as I possibly can. But I just want to emphasize that the, the um, anybody that contacts me about um, any job, their identity is not passed on to the panel. And, and we see that as a very important um, aspect of, uh, of the recruitment process. And in fact, the, you know, up until the point that we do the, 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 the teaching presentations of the shortlisted candidates, only the panel and me <laughs> or, or uh, the, the, the college administrator will know anything about the people that have applied. Um, so I would normally, if this was a, um, a job that was um, more on the university side, then I, I would support um, most of the recruitment um, from an administrative point of view. Um, so when we get the applications at the closing date, we would there might sometimes be a bit of a negotiation over a late one. It's up to the panel whether they would consider a late application, not, not me. I would always ask them if they wanted to look at it. Um, then uh, there's a suitable period of time after the closing date for the panel to read the applications. Uh, we'll have a date which is always very hard to find <laughs> for in, uh, the shortlisting and the interviews uh, with so many busy people. Um, and uh, we so we work towards that shortlisting date. Um, by that time, at that meeting, I would have asked every member of the panel to give me their sort of initial indications of each application. And each panelist is asked to assess each candidate against every single criteria. So it's very, very thorough. We are then assemble those um, uh, initial uh, uh, thoughts about the candidates and then the panel will always meet. They have to meet in person um, and they will discuss each, each applicant. Uh, they will tend to discuss um, they will they will go through every single one some some might be uh, trigger more discussion than others but everybody gets attention from the panel and then um, that shortlisting panel will then at that stage usually also decide how they're going to actually assess the candidates um, from the, the practical point of view like thinking about how long the interview will be exactly what the topic of the uh, presentation will be um, and and at that stage how many applications how many applicants they want to shortlist. So if there's an exceptional field, they might try very hard to fit in more, but there's usually a sort of agreed, you know, approximate number that would be shortlisted. And then from there, obviously, uh, we make sure everybody who applied gets, um, is notified of the outcome of their application one way or the other. And then from then on, people who are shortlisted, obviously are told um, what what's happening next. Um, and then, uh, there's a couple of points that have come up in the question. So one of them is um, it, it's just something I want to clarify about these different types of jobs that we keep talking about. The associate professor with a tutorial fellowship, without a tutorial fellowship, um, they all in, in in on paper they all definitely add up to the same amount of stint points. So each one has a, a teaching which we convert into stint, and they're all effectively the same. It's just that the teaching is given some you know sometimes more to the college, sometimes more to the university, um, and in terms of salary 
the jobs are all on one grade in terms of the range of salary points, um, but it will depend on the weighting as to how much that salary you get from the university and how much you get from the college. But it adds up again, it adds up to exactly the same amount for exactly the same amount of teaching. It's just whether it's more tutorial teaching in the core or option subjects or whether it's very specialised um, subject that just that is taught centrally centrally by the faculty. So that's there's, you know, in, in theory, they, they're all um, equal to each other. Um, and uh, I talked about salary. And then the only other thing I was going to say is that every, uh, there have been some some questions about all the different kinds of jobs that we advertise. And I just want to say that um, although they it can it can be quite slightly tricky to find all our jobs on the university website. So we reproduce everything that we're advertising on the faculty website. And also everything we advertise goes on to Jobs AC UK. So that is the number one place. I would say that's the number one place to go to to make sure that you are up to speed with every type of post that we're advertising, whether it's a staff statutory professor, uh, an associate professor, or um, um, a, a departmental lectureship or any other kind of post. Um, so I think I will stop there. And then if there are any other questions in the chat, I will be able to answer those later. But thank you very much for all the questions because they're really helping us. So thanks a lot. Thank you, Charlotte. Much appreciated. We've got about 15 to 17 minutes or so. Uh, that's a nice chunk. Like I said, um, we're going to answer some of the dominant questions that came out of the correspondence from you before today. And then we will also answer the questions that have come up during the course of the last hour and 10 minutes um, in the Q&A. To help us prioritize the Q&A questions, just um, make sure you help us with an uptick of a question that resonates with you. So if someone had typed a question that you also had in mind, then it will just make it easier for me to know that that is obviously a burning question amongst a large number of you as attendees when I do have a look at the Q&A questions there. Kristen, why don't we start with a fun one? And any, any member of the panel can answer these questions. Um, I said rather cheesily at the beginning, but it is true. There's no such thing as an Oxford experience. Um, so I'm sure every member would have a different answer, but answer this question, but uh, Kristen wanted to start us off. Uh, someone had written to us and asked, what are three interesting or distinguishing features about Oxford University slash Oxford? Uh, thanks very much, Eusebius. Uh, so I, I thought this was a great question and the three I, I put on my list and I'd be interested to hear if other panelists have Different things on theirs were first, the peculiarly high degree of autonomy that academics enjoy. Uh, academic jobs in general are autonomous, but I think Oxford has a pe peculiarly strong form of commitment to academic autonomy. Um, and this is a great privilege um, of which I'm acutely aware uh, as I do my job on, on, on a day-to-day -day basis. Secondly, the, um, the excellence across the university I, in every department, every division, every faculty, uh, which means that you are a member of a world leading institution in every respect, uh, coupled with a commitment to interdisciplinarity, which means that uh, your colleagues from other uh, departments and faculties are genuinely interested in working with you. And thirdly, uh, that this is a collegiate university. Now, having two jobs, or ha as Nicola termed it so beautifully, two centres of gravity, is not without its complexity or, or its costs. And some of you have alluded to some of these complexities and costs in questions in the Q&A. Um, but it is also a great privilege to have two centres of gravity. Uh, one, which is primarily uh, other members of the law faculty who work on aspects of, of legal doctrine, albeit with different methodologies, but the other, a collection of scholars and a world leading uh, world leading scholars and students from all different disciplines and you are a member of both communities and so if you're interested in doing interdisciplinary work the college is one uh, important um, impetus for such work and it provides a forum for you to road test your ideas with colleagues uh, from other disciplines and it's just inspiring to be able to see what your colleagues are doing across the university so in my college we've had a series of talks uh, over the pandemic period from, from different members of the college community talking about their work online uh, including the scientists in the university and I found this to be uh, very very inspirational to be part of this community and to hear what uh, our world leading scientists are doing. Thanks. 
Thanks, Kristen. That's that's absolutely fabulous. Can I move to another question, or do any of you want to add to that as my panelists? Well, you see, I just want to um, add quickly that the research and teaching uh, uh, dynamic for individual academics at Oxford is goes follows a very uh, specific uh, time cycle. Uh, during term, um, it's almost impossible to get any research done uh, because terms are extremely teaching heavy, but our terms are short. We only have three eight week terms, that's 24 weeks in the year. Uh, and not only is teaching concentrated in the terms, most of the faculty and college admin uh, at most takes a week on either side of term. So say 10 weeks per term. The rest of the time is can be dedicated to, and we, you know, most of us are dedicated to research uh, without any interference from teaching uh, or indeed from admin. Okay, thanks for that. There's a, there's a couple of questions that came out during correspondence and also to some extent worded differently in the Q and A's. I'm gonna combine them although they're distinct, but they, they relate to threshold requirements um, for, for getting into any of these different academic jobs. And um, just put up your hand if you want to answer it. I mean, all of you are capable of answering it, obviously. The first question is, is a PhD a necessary criterion for a job at Oxford University? And adjacent to that, um, what if I was a legal professional? Can I go from being, I don't know, SQ to coming to be um, a colleagues of Nicholas, for example? You see, that is a very short answer and it's a specific version of Charlotte's general answer. See the criteria. Uh, and there is a diversity of practice, some college, some jobs for the same position because of our diversity in colleges will insist on a PhD. Some will require a higher law degree, so at least a master's or a PhD, and some don't care. As long as you have an undergraduate law degree, um, <laughs> there may well be colleges that don't even care about that. Right? So uh, all I will say is uh, look at the criterion. Okay, that's very helpful. And that's a really interesting demystifying of Oxford. In my beloved subject in philosophy, for example, for many decades, the Bachelor of Philosophy was probably regarded as the most prestigious philosophy qualification you could have at Oxford, and a default was just something else. Yeah. Um, so that's really, really interesting. Another question we had coming through correspondence is, and there are many present here today, PhD candidates who are near the completion stage of their degrees. Any advice for them? Well, so it's not unheard of for a recent doctoral, uh, for a recent doctorate, doctorate uh, to get an associate professorship. It's obviously uh, challenging because these are demanding jobs, but the criterion will make it very clear which quality must be achieved in which the candidates uh, only need to show potential for. So that is, some, so again, you know, it's, I know that it's, it's not a dodge, uh, although it may sound like one, look at the research criterion and see, for example, if it says, you know, an, a, a, a track record of uh, a research output that uh, is internationally recognized, that will be difficult for a doctoral student to show. But if the criterion says uh, a track record of or potential for a, a research output of international standard, then a doctoral student can arguably meet that criterion. So, um, so we really, really take, and uh, the number of eyes that look at those uh, criteria before they are finalized, uh, is a lot. So I, I really would read the words very carefully and decide for yourself whether you qualify. If in doubt, ask. If still in doubt, what do you have to lose except some time writing the application mm -hmm. apply? 
I suppose it might be worth adding, Karen, that associate professor, that track, it's equivalent to tenure track, isn't it? So there is a certain degree these days, at any rate, of seniority, shall we say, or at least experience, perhaps, that's a better way of putting it, that may be assumed within the further particulars for those kinds of posts. But as Taryn says, you need to look at the specifics. I'm going to come. Thank you for that, uh, Nicola. Thank you for adding that. I'm going to combine two questions again, partly coming out of the questions we've got before the event, and then probably the most uh, popular question, at least by ticking on the Q and A in the Q and A chat box. Um, and the question is: Do you have an indication of which areas of law? jobs will be available in or are available in and then a cousin of that question what happened if i've got all my qualifications in the global south rather than in europe and the usa and in england is that a disadvantage the second one is a straightforward one to answer which is absolutely not um, a disadvantage uh, as i said it's the criteria that matter. And as long as your Global South experience can speak to those criteria, uh, just as if you were from the Global North, uh, you, you absolutely would, would be, uh, uh, should be applying. The first question is a slightly harder one to answer. And I'm not trying to, to, to create any suspense around this. It's just that four jobs that are coming up have a very complex mix of topics. Between them, I, I doubt if any area of law is left out. So I think any specialist will find something, some of those jobs to apply. But notice that, and this is something maybe we should have clarified during the presentations, is that colleges and, fac and the faculty may have different teaching needs, um, which means that the criteria will specify uh, and usually how that will pan out is that if it's a college heavy job, if the college is paying two thirds of your salary, then the college needs, uh, the subjects that the college needs will be essential and the subjects that the faculty needs will be desirable. Uh, and that will be flipped if it's a faculty heavy job, the faculty is paying most of the salary. And they really mean essential and desirable. You have to be able to teach the essential uh, subjects uh, but the desirable ones are basically help us distinguish between equally good candidates. And, you know, uh, it's that final uh, uh, distinguishing mark that, that is uh, anybody who's been on a recruitment panel knows uh, it's very difficult to, to choose between uh, mm -hmm. some fantastic people. So, uh, and, so what I can say, and, you know, you, you're probably not going to be in suspense for too long because at least the first of the adverts will come out this week if uh, if not today or tomorrow uh, is that the faculties list is likely to be um, a a bigger a larger list because the faculty obviously needs many more subjects the colleges are likely to be more specific in what they want but again this will change this will differ and the faculty may ask for different subjects okay. for different colleges um, realistically, not in theory, realistically, how much time is there for research? And with the many hours in theory uh, of prep work that students do for the tutorials uh, when they're not at the pub, uh, how much work do I do as the tutor preparing for it? Uh, the, I think this is a great qu a question, um, and it's the answer is embarrassing in terms of how much time you pre you prepare for your teaching. <laughs> I mean, I, I especially when I, I give when I teach a subject for the first time, I spend an enormous amount of time preparing to do that. It gets better and faster every year. Um, but the first time I teach a subject, I ha have the view that if students are required to read something, then obviously I too am required to read it. Uh, and so if you have a very long list, then you're going to be spending a, a very long time reading your own lists uh, as long as your students. And I think that that view is shared by my, my colleagues acro across the faculty, all of whom take their teaching very seriously. Um, but it does get faster the longer you go along. Um, but certainly 
at the, for the first time around, you would be spending more time preparing for a tutorial than your students. I think that's fair to say, but you will give these tutorials year on year and it will get easier and easier. But the first couple of years in post are stressful because you might be teaching things for the first time uh, and you're also trying to progress your research. But the university and the faculty are very aware of that and the processes of initial review are designed to take this into account. Uh, and there is support through mentorship and, and other uh, structures in the faculty to help shepherd you through the intensive early years of preparing to deliver high quality teaching. In terms of research time, uh, I agree with uh, Taryn that in term time, you, you try to tick things over, meet urgent deadlines, um, submit things that are due, do proofs of something that's been accepted, but it's very difficult to make significant headway on a new project uh, and to do significant new writing in term time. And so out of term time is much prized time for academics uh, at Oxford because that's the time where you really have an opportunity to write, write a paper from fresh, um, which you can hopefully then finish in the, in the following term. But you, you do have to strike a careful balance and some terms it's, or years it's slightly out of whack and then you seek, seek to rebalance that uh, with, with the advice of your mentors in, in the faculty. Third last we question. You mentioned the sabbatical system, you said yes, because that is not something that obtains in other institutions the right, the entitlement to leave of a term for every six years, of every six years, every six terms. Of <laughs> so, you know, that, that's a significant aspect. Absolutely. Third last question, very quickly, Tarun, do you care about my grades? What if I was a naughty boy in undergrad and I only became serious at 35? So, um, <clears throat> usually at the time of recruitment for an associate professorship levels, um, I, I don't remember seeing an application which highlighted uh, school, school grades uh, or even university uh, first degree grades. So uh, the short answer is no. Uh, you know, if you tell me that I was a terrible student, <laughs> we'll probably start getting worried <laughs> about you. Uh, but, um, but what you're being judged on is your academic career. Uh, Second last question, uh, Kristen. What if I'm very modern and um, I now do interdisciplinary studies and I make Charlotte happy by doing some really arcane research in the area of law and Victorian literature? As in, is this the kind of research that would be prized by the faculty? Yeah, do you, do you, is it a disadvantage to, to not be strictly focusing on English law, but to, for example, do social legal studies, because I also have an element of my work that cares for actual empiricism? I, I, I mean, the answer is that this sounds like a fantastic research agenda to me. It sounds very interesting and, and important. And the, the faculty is not at all prescriptive about what counts or qualifies as um, internationally a leading uh, scholarship. But the question is, are you making a contribution to, mm -hmm. to scholarly community in your work? Uh, and, and, and is there a trajectory in, in your research that shows um, that you are going to be in a position to make such a contribution? Um, so you're going to be able to make very very high quality uh, contribution to scholarship in the fields in which you work using the methodologies that you use. And there's a very rich um, variety of methods that are used within the faculty, as well as in cross faculty or cross div divisional work. So I would say that sounds like a very interesting project to me. <laughs> Fantastic. Sorry, I'm laughing at a private joke between me and Charlotte here. Thanks for that answer, Kristen. And last but not least, a question that really requires 90 minutes on its own. I'm sorry to smuggle it in, but I think um, I need to honor this question, even if we just flag a direction of a discussion, and maybe it will be the basis for a webinar going uh, forward at Arun. So between Kristen and Arun, one of you can take it. You'll have 60 seconds to answer it. I've had a couple of questions in the Q&A where someone goes, wait, now that everyone is worried about um, minorities, should I even apply as a pale male who went to Yale? And on the other extreme, we've had a couple of questions from folks who say, if you're so serious about minorities, I can't even see a phenotypically black person on my screen. What say you, Kristen? Right. Sorry, Taryn, you go ahead and then I'll follow you. Go ahead. Okay, well, I, I just wanted to say that um, uh, race is not a criterion for selection. It is a criterion for our outreach efforts. So 
to the extent that we want candidates from underrepresented groups, underrepresented in Oxford, to apply to us to broaden the pool. And this event is very much part of that agenda. Uh, we would love to have many more applications from groups that we know we have failed to hire uh, so far. But uh, at the recruitment stage, every individual is an individual and not a representative of any group, uh, whatever their color or background, and we will treat you as an individual. I don't. Um, I mean, there are a number of very important questions that have come from um, Dr. Changita, and you know, any reply to these in the zero time remaining, you know, risk sounding glib. So I acknowledge the importance of these questions, and as Taryn says, the additional very significant work that remains to be done across the university in answering these questions. Um, but I suppose my overall answer would, would be, if you have a commitment to to scholarship and to teaching at the highest level, we very much encourage you to apply. Uh, can I add one more final thought, uh, UCBS, that, you know, this is in keeping with the pipeline uh, issue that, you know, apart from this outreach, another effort that we have done is just recently announced uh, some uh, postgraduate research scholarships for uh, Black and Asian minority ethnic uh, groups, uh, members. And uh, so, so the idea is that we broaden the pool uh, of people who can make competitive applications. And there are five, five new scholarships there. Yeah. Uh, Kristen, Tarun, Nicola, and Charlotte, I wanna thank all of you uh, for this very, very useful session. And for you as the attendees, thank you so much for being present, your interest in Oxford University, and hopefully this has demystified a cluster of your questions. This event has been recorded. It will be communicated to you. And if you have further questions, of course, uh, you know where you can reach out to the university and we'll do our best to help you understand what is required for you um, to show off your best. And from my side, just wanna say, it is a strange place is Oxford, but it's also a place that is absolutely unique. Some of my best memories are from there. And um, probably on a final note, one of the most important things you can do, we do this with scholarship drives. Tarun and I were both Oxford scholars. It is critically important to not self-exclude, lead that to a panel mm -hmm. rather than thinking that you are not good enough. All the best in your application process and all the best in your careers going forward. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you.